Welcome to A Pint with Shawnee B. Thank you for tuning in. It is a sad one this uh, time around um, because we've again lost a former guest of A Pint with Shawnee B, which has now happened three times in the last 12 months. The podcast was tootling away fine for four years and and now has a mortality rate approaching that of COVID. We lost uh, Pete Dunn in this time last year, a uh, famous artist and musician great guy and I, again i only met him late in his life but he had a real a really strong impact on me and then later in the year last year we lost dave buchanan wonderful wonderful guy a guy from the uk and uh, a month ago today on the march the 20th uh, it came much closer to home and my own father um, left us which was a tragedy for his wife of over 50 years and his my three sisters and myself and his grandchildren and sons-in-law and friends and cousins and relatives and all those people who who loved him in january he was diagnosed with um, mantel's lymphoma an aggressive cancer and he was staring down the barrel of uh, probably six months of chemotherapy which was unlikely to have worked out well for him he was 85 years of age and um as i like to say even though things happened quickly and we were all a little bit shocked at how quickly he did get out with his hair and his uh dignity intact and i know he would have he would have liked that um not many people can say that their father is a famous ventriloquist and my father was um just that he was a preeminent ventriloquist and in Ireland for four or five decades he opened the Irish television station RTE in the early 60s and he had his own television show for 10 years and brought an awful lot of joy laughter and fun to Irish children growing up at that time and he was still doing his ventriloquism right till the end in fact he launched a new puppet on the world about two years ago and was uh, even doing ventriloquism the night before he died for the nurses with a little toy that his youngest granddaughter Sienna sent in to the hospital with her mum and um, even the podcast that you're going to hear my, my dad in true my dad style insisted that his sidekick Gerald one of his probably most famous dummy would be in attendance so you, you're going to hear a rather weird three-hander where there's three people in the room there's my dad Gerald and myself yapping away um, it's hard to know what to say without sounding too maudlin about one's own father. And, you know, he was he was my dad and, you know, we had a an eventful father-son relationship like many are. He used to love sparring with me about my socialist views versus his more right-wing conservative ones. But he was a, he was a very kind man and he was a man who deep down believed that people should be looked after if they were in trouble and he would always try and help whenever he could uh, as much as he could you know he was born in 1936 and grew up in the 40s wrong side of the tracks worked hard at a scholarship his way through college and school got bitten by the ventriloquist ventriloquism bug when he was a young teenager and set about making his own uh, dummies you know, was appearing in, in Christmas pantos at the Abbey when he was 16. He'd come cycle home from school on his bike and have his dinner and then go in to appear on stage. And so he'd a, he'd a, he'd a wonderful, wonderfully big life. It's strange when people die in this climate because you, you, we, we had a funeral which was only 10 mourners. Obviously it was broadcast on the internet and it was a lovely moment when the hearse left the church where we drove down our road in Caventilli and all the people from the houses um, came out and just stood to attention as the her as the cortege drove by, which was a very emotional moment. And, you know, even my own friends, the amount of them who have taken time to write to me, some I hadn't heard from in, in a few years, um, about how he had touched them and how he, you know, he had inspired them um which was just lovely to to hear i don't know just thinking about 
death, it's something that is going to come to every one of us. If there's nothing we can be sure of, it's the impermanence of our life. And you'll hear dad talking on the podcast about his own father who, who died when, when my dad was 15 and how he wished he'd, he'd, he'd spoken to him more and got more information out of him before it was, as he put it, too late. In that regard, I was very happy to have formally sat down with him because we talked a lot about things that we didn't talk about, which I think if you all look at your relationship with your parents or loved ones, that happens quite a lot. And I've always said this podcast and the reason we play these tribute repeats of them I think is it's a testament to the person's life and it's important that we we try and understand our parents and try and understand the sort of oral history of a, of a person's life and, and hear them analyzing it. There was a lot of things in the podcast when I did interview my father that I that surprised me a little bit. And, you know, this impermanence, as I say, is coming to us all. The one thing we can be sure of is that we are going to die. And the one thing we can also be sure of is we never know when. But I think we spend an awful lot of our time sort of focusing on the wrong things. And I think COVID has done an awful lot to, whilst it's been extremely irritating and debilitating mentally for a lot of people, it has put us in this place of, self-introspection, looking at one's life and trying to understand what life is about and what the meaning of it is. I think far too many of us uh, get caught up in the in the rat trap and the acquisitive consumerism that drives us forward and the need to signal our success by material goods. And dad dying was kind of weird because of its sort of suddenness and the fact that you, I suppose for the last month, still find it hard to believe that he's not there anymore. Um, and I know for, you know, my sisters, the same applies. You can't ring him up and get his point of view. And he, you know, he loved, he loved being a kind of an advisor. I think I've got a bit of that in me myself from him where he always wanted to hear what was going on. And he always wanted to give his opinion. We had a, we had a funny argument once where I remember saying to him that, and I was quite, I was quite cross. We were, we were having a, we were having a kind of a, a heated debate, shall we say. And, um, I, I said to him, do you realize, Dad, that, I, you know, every piece of advice that you've given me over my entire life, I've done the exact opposite and it seems to have worked out okay. Um, which isn't true, by the way. It was said in the heat of the moment. But in classic my dad's style, he cut the green wire by saying, well, now all you have to do is listen to what I have to say and do the exact opposite. <laughs> which was sort of all him. He had great faith as well, which was interesting for me as a sort of a as an atheist to to see the solace of what great faith can bring to people in the closing stages because i remember watching a documentary recently with alan bennett who's an atheist as well and alan bennett said the biggest problem with atheism is that there's no one to thank you know, for a great day. There's no one to thank for happiness or those rare days when you get supreme joy entering into your life and you think, this is what it must be about, this this achievement of some pinnacle of happiness and, 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 and joy and, and laughter. They don't come around that often. And, and my father used to say to me, <laughs> which which again, we could have great theological discussions about. He used to say, well, I'm going to keep my faith because when I die, if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. And if I'm right, ha -ha. 
To which, of course, I would say stuff like, well, do you not think that God would know that you're faking it for that reason? And we head off down a rabbit hole together and spar with each other for a while. Um, I suppose another, uh, and apologies again for this rambling thing, it's it's bloody hard to know what to say. But another thing that, that, that sort of touched me was my mother, I think, you know, the day of, the day after the funeral, said, you know, she never heard him say a bad word about anybody. And that's hard to do in life, you know. It's hard to to be tolerant and to be... And I think my father's tolerance grew as he got older. And in fact, you know, the one thing that I took from his death was, you know, kind of, we need to just stop losing our shit and getting all worked up about stuff that doesn't really matter. But... Yeah, it was just amazing for Mum to have said that about him. Um, and he was. He was a kind man who you always felt wanted the best for you, no matter who you were. You know, and there's friends of mine and exes of my sisters and myself who just loved him. And, you know, my favourite... Those of you who know me know my favourite movie is... Um, it's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and uh, there's a great quote in that I may not have it fully off here but it was said that when a, when, any, when any man dies or woman when any man or woman dies they leave an awfully big hole and um, I don't think that changes I think that um, is a constant too so I don't really want to talk uh, much more other than to say that you know my father was a great guy and he will be missed and you know any of you who are listening to this cherish uh the particularly the older people in your life um cherish them listen to them uh take down their stories take down their wisdom take down the lessons that they've learned and care for them so anyway <laughs> godspeed george boyle and in true my father style, here he is with his dummy Gerald and myself in an interview we did for, I think it was episode 78, which would have come out in 2018. Godspeed, Dad. We will all miss you. Welcome to another Pint with Shawnee B. This is a very interesting one. I have never uh, had two people on the show. I like to have uh, face-to-face interviews, as most of you who listen regularly know. And I kind of have two people on the show for the first time today, so I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not sure how it's going to go. Uh, I'm in my home city of Dublin, and I'm actually in my home home in Cabin Tilly, which is in South County, Dublin. And for the second time in a Pint with Shawnee B, there is a member of my family on the show today. It is my father, George Boyle. Uh, He is one of Ireland's foremost ventriloquists and has been for the last 50 or 60 years. And he has kindly contacted his old partner in crime by the name of Gerald. And Gerald and George are here today for your delectation. So welcome, George, first of all. Thank you very much, Sean. And welcome, Gerald. Thank you very much, Sean. What is all this about, George? You're on the podcast. A podcast. That's right. What's a podcast? Well, now, Gerald, it's um, it's sort of the internet. Ah, go on. It is. So what? Well, you see, Gerald, if, for example, if you were down in, 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 in Kerry. Yeah. And if you were out in the mountains. Yeah. Where, where, where Star Wars was. Where Star Wars were, yeah. Or if you were up in Crow Patrick, yeah. And if you went around and, 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 and you turned on your iPhone, you could listen to this program. I could not. You could so. I couldn't. Could I, Sean? I, do you have an iPhone? No, I couldn't. That's why I couldn't ah. hear it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you stay I quiet for a while. I spoiled your joke okay, there. Okay, you did, you did, you I'm did. I'm sorry about did. that, Gerald. Oh, but yeah, no, it's a... It's a it's what, sort of, what sort of a straight man is this guy? No, I'm <laughs> sorry, know. I'm sorry. Not to worry, not to worry. It's a live show, you know. Yeah, ask okay. a question. Anyway, go on. All right, then. Here All we right. go. Well, my father, as I said, has been uh, uh, practicing ventriloquist for how long? Oh, he's practicing still. <laughs> <laughs> 60 years nearly, aren't you? Uh, what, about 60 uh, years. Where yeah. did you two meet? Well, I came along sort of later because 
First of all, he was practicing with somebody else. Isn't that right? That's right. I, I used to make my own ventriloquist dummies because I couldn't afford to buy them. Oh, you poor fella. That's right. They were very expensive at the time. Yeah. And uh, consequently, I, I made uh, a few earlier iterations of Gerald right. out of papier-mâché and I used those at school when I was performing for my school colleagues. Oh, yeah. You were always making fun of the teachers, weren't you? That was one of the things we did, yes. So you were born in Dublin, uh, yes. George. I'm going to talk to George he first, He wanted to Gerald. hear his mother. <laughs> Can we wait until we get to your life before we talk about you and see how okay. how okay. George came along first? I know when I'm not wanted. No, you're oh, wanted. Right. You're wanted. <laughs> no, no. Gerald, this is the first time I've had two people on the podcast, and I'm a bit kind of shaky myself oh, as a know. presenter. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard. <laughs> I'll do the best I can for you. All right. So, George, you were uh, you were born in Dublin in, I was, in a yes. sort of a working class area. Yes, my father was a civil servant. He was very conscious that servants need to be civil if they're civil servants. Very good, and was very conscious that. Uh, he had a job to do, and he always did it to the best of his ability. What sort of a job did he do in the He was service? in social welfare, would you believe? Ah. And he was also in the Department of Education. You're not kidding. Now, you stay quiet now, okay? And he was in the army? He was in the British Army during the First World War. He enlisted early on in the war, uh, was more or less cut before firing a shot by the Germans, and spent, I think, the best part of the war in, in hospital. We don't really know what the story was because, like most young people, we always left it too late to ask our parents about what went on. Well, here I am. Their lives. Well, here you are. <laughs> well, I can't tell you about my father. I hope it's I not can, too late. I can tell you about me. Some of the things. One of the things that people listening to the show would probably find weird is that an Irish man would go fight for the British Army in the war, which started in 1914 at a time when we were probably as close as we'd ever come to um, getting rid of the British or fighting them out of our country. But a lot of Irish people had no jobs and there's, there's a reason behind quite a lot of the Irish that went Well, there. again, the, 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 as you know, there was a guy called Redmond who was recruiting people from Ireland to go over and fight for the small nations and make sure that they weren't overrun. To what extent that uh, influenced his particular choice, I don't know. So you don't know how he got injured, but was he injured when he came back or was he? No, he, was, he got uh, pneumonia in hospital. I think he was in Mannheim. We had some pictures of him looking very gaunt in, in a hospital there. I know many times when I was out with him that he mentioned that if it weren't for the German doctors at the time, we would be sitting here today. So he was a prisoner of war. He was a prisoner of war, yes. And uh, he came back. So this was well before you uh, were... Around. Oh, he wasn't even a twinkle in the eye of the Lord at the time. <laughs> but uh, yes, he came back. First of all, I think he stayed in England mm. and he worked with what was called the, the Crown Services over there, again in the civil service. And after the Irish situation developed, I think around 1922, the new government of the time wanted people to come back from abroad who had experience and who yeah. could run or help develop the civil service and he came back at that time. So Ireland became its own country in 1922, leaving Northern Ireland as part of Great Britain, which it still is to this day. But from 1922, we had to set up a whole country from scratch, basically. So this is why they needed talent to come back and, and help f found things. And then he met your mother. He met my mother Josephine. around 1927, I think, and, and uh, got married and he had four children. So yeah. what were your earliest memories growing up in that at that time in like 1930s, 40s Dublin? So there was another war. But there was indeed. Soon and, after and, you arrived. Uh, I remember when I was five, the bombing of North Strand. The blackouts were very much in evidence because we were always afraid, although we were neutral, the government was afraid that our lights would act as a beacon for bombers coming across to bomb yeah. Belfast or, or Northern Ireland. Then I remember walking with my father presumably in the North Strand and seeing houses in rubble. I have a, a graphic memory of, of a, a bedpost, an iron bedpost mm. sticking out of the rubble with one of these golden knobs on top. Yeah. I vaguely remember this exchanging a few words with my father saying, have you seen service yourself? And him explaining that he had been in the First World War uh, and uh, had his own memories what those memories were. I you never know. found out, yeah. No. Um, sadly, too late, too sadly late. Your father, you always leave it too late. Well, your father died when you were very young. He died when I was uh, 16, yes, he did. 
uh, that was rather a, a traumatic event I bet. To, be, to be sure yeah. mm. you were uh, you and were my a- mother had, uh, had to fend for herself the first major event happened uh, in that uh, the year following in 1952 53 because the Abbey Theatre burnt down in 1951, I think it was. But the players who were famous throughout the world were, were kept together. They were repositioned into the Queen's Theatre. And every year they had an Irish pantomime on. I auditioned with my then partner. Who was that? Bartley. Oh, yeah, Bartley, yes. I remember him, yes. Yeah. So a segue Bartley. there, because uh, George's yes. first puppet, a uh, dummy, um, I'm, I'm not sure, is that technically He's allowed? He's calling me a dummy. Is that, is Take that... my head off and hit him with it. Uh, no, uh, uh, are we, are we politically on. incorrect calling you a dummy, Gerald? Well, you can call me a dummy, you can call me a dummy. I don't care what you're calling me so long as it's not early in the morning. Okay? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So yes. we'll use the word... Uh, dummy will do fine. Dummy. Yeah, that's um, Okay, I don't mind. Your first dummy was uh, an old Shanna Key called Barclay right? that's right yeah he he, he, he was uh, with him in school that's right I used to do the show with Barclay uh, he was Santa Claus's assistant mm. no he wasn't was he not no he was his, his assistant's assistant oh that's right he yeah. was assistant to the assistant that's right yeah. and she was gorgeous <laughs> oh boy she was gorgeous yes, her name was Doreen Madden and the Santa Claus was a fellow called Martin Dempsey who left the civil service to become an actor much to the amazement of everybody because he left a pensionable job yeah. for the dicey career Creative. of yeah. a, a thespian. Did you say thespian? I did. Without moving your lips? No, I move my lips. You you were able to say thespian as well. Thespian. It's a tricky yeah, word. Yeah, it's, it's a nice. tricky word, Gerald, yeah, because yeah, you can yeah. often mix it up with another word. That's- Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> None of that. There are children. So before we just finished that Abbey story, how did you meet Barclay? Barclay I made <laughs> down in, in Drumshambo. Your father's place. That's right. Drumshambo's in the Drumshambo west coast of Ireland. Yeah. It was very expensive to buy plaster scene in those days, you see. So there was a special product called Daub out in the bogs. And you could make moulds from this. So right. we made a, a mould of an old guy's face put pepper mashy on top of that and when it was all dried out you scooped out the, the mould and then you had the, the, the form for the face and yeah. with that I made this old guy Barty Makonmara I called him right. okay and uh, he was my, my first uh, But how did you end up getting the inspiration to get into ventriloquism in the first place? Okay well um, I was coming home on a bus one day when I was 10 mm. and there was a guy a young lad on the bus who had just bought the wizard comic this had a story about a ventriloquist called the Wooden Sheriff of Skeeker Creek. This ventriloquist, who was very small, he was only three or four feet tall, was touring the West, and he was so small he was afraid to do it on his own. So he built this massive dummy, and he used to sit on the dummy's knee, <laughs> and the dummy pretended he was the dummy. And oh. the, 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 So the whole series was how Clever. this young fella kept people confused so that they thought the sheriff was real and that he was just a dummy but uh, yeah. it caught my imagination and I came home and my brother happily was getting the wizard every week so I was reading these stories I persecuted my father who was a great uh, my mother and father both uh, were interested in reading and they come back with armfuls of books so I said look any books in ventriloquism so he found a couple of books in ventriloquism I read them from cover to cover many times found out the basic rudiments and practiced and practiced. I was 10 when I started. I suppose partly came around when I was, what, 14, 15 or so. You know? It's amazing the way one story triggers a small mind to go, you know, that young mind to get so sucked into it. Well, to, I, yeah, to, I often wonder why, why, why ventriloquism and, and yeah. why, you know, why the theatre and why making jokes and things and... Uh, well, we come to that later on, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, we're back then to the was when you made Barclay. Tell me what sort of happened. So, when you had so anyway, I was on the Abbey Theatre, and I, I, I felt very important because here I was on the Abbey Theatre, mm. and Gerald. Yes, you know what the Abbey Theatre stands for. Well, if it stands for you, it stands for anything. <laughs> now, that's not what I mean. But uh, I was coming out, having done the show, and I was told that two young ladies wanted to see me at the at the stage door. The, the elder of the two, her name was Eta Hines, and happened to be a journalist. And she said, would I mind if she did a piece for me on the Sunday Independent? So right. I didn't know what the ethic was in the Abbey Theatre because it was a team 
a work business yeah. in the theatre and you know this bit player coming in as Santa Claus's assistant assistant yeah. getting a piece in the paper and I didn't know how to go down but anyway she asked me to go along to get a photograph taken she'd send in a photographer the following day and then she said to the young lady who was with her oh, we should get his autograph you know and she very very slowly sort of produced her autograph book and I signed it nonchalantly as if I did this every other day. What age you? I was just uh, 16 at this <laughs> age, you know. I know a lot of people who can say they said, pretend, signed their first autograph pretended, at 16. Uh, pretended that this was a, just a normal event. It transpired that a very good friend of mine, Pat O'Brien, whom you mm-hmm. know, happened to be at the theatre that same night really? with this lady. And she told me that the young girl had gone round to get Ray McAnally's autograph, who was right. the star of the show, right. <laughs> and wasn't at all pleased at getting this ventriloquist guy ahead of him. <laughs> ahead of him, you know. <laughs> what was it like going home that night when you just... I mean, how, oh, how long was the pantomime run? About three weeks? About or? seven or eight weeks, right. you know. Like every morning I'd, I'd cycle in on my bicycle to school and the big billboard was on, Shatanta was a coo, Coo Cullen and his dog, and I'd say, geez, I'm on that tonight, like, you know, yeah. and uh, come home, have my dinner, and cycle back into the into the theatre, when I'd done my piece of about 10 minutes or so, i hide myself home to the study, study yeah, wow. and only appeared on the, uh, on the grand finale on the last night, oh. you know, but it was a fantastic experience, seven nights, you know, you're forced to do the best you can each night, the repetition and trying to learn and getting the feel of the getting audience tight, and yeah. knowing it was very interesting. What did your friends in school think of it? Well, it, it, it was very funny. I was doing the same material all the time. Right. <laughs> but after I did the Abbey, everybody told me how much I had improved and how fresh my material was. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't say anything. Yeah. They started listening to you because you... Well, this yeah. is the point. All of a sudden you had status because you were on the Abbey Theatre. Yeah. And boy, oh boy, did I milk that for a long, long time. Did any of the guys in school, like, bully you or give up to think ah, you were above no your bully, station? No, but, but you see, uh, we had this uh, this concert every year in the Osnum Hall and all the kids would go along to it. I was uh, about 12, I suppose, at this stage in secondary school and uh, the older boys would help me rejig my scripts so that we got all the names, the okay. pet names of the, the teachers, teachers in, yeah. you see. So every time I mentioned Pinky, there'd be a big, hey, or Boxer, hey. I mean, I was the star of the show. However, the following day when I went in, I found that some people weren't quite amused. You, you found know? out why Boxer was called Boxer. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Boxer had me out at the, de- out at the, the blackboard ex- explaining why the two sides of an isosceles triangle or whatever, right <laughs> angle triangle, are equal to the, 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 or the whatever it is, you know. Oh, you've forgotten it already. There you go now. <laughs> it's easy to forget. Whatever. Uh, I, I feel this may have been partly the reason why I got a scholarship <laughs> that year because I figured I better know my stuff because I was a marked man. You were a marked man, yeah. And uh, I got a scholarship, thanks to God, in my intercert and then I got a scholarship in my final year which helped me go into my engineering degree. so it's worth uh, pointing out that you were uh, educated Oscalga, which means in the Irish language right that's right and your first dummy Barclay was a Gaelic speaking dummy that's correct and so explain the idea of who Barclay was in the Shanna Key story well the point that hit me there was a very good friend of mine when I was 12 passed away at school his name was uh, Gabriel Commons his mother <clears throat> used to send in tickets to concerts in the Francis Xavier Hall, many of them in Irish, and I'd go along to them. And I was struck by how sad the songs were and how little humour was uh, in the the various uh, acts that were on these shows. And I thought, gee, you know, I must try and change that. So Barclay generally sang happy songs and uh, he told reason be good clean jokes yeah. <laughs> and uh, raised a laugh I got great satisfaction out of hearing people being happy mm. at a show but Same Barclay way. was an old man explain, explain to our listeners from overseas what a Shana Key is well a Shana Key is, is, is an old gentleman of uh, the roads sometimes but maybe not but a guy who'd have people in his house and would tell stories about the old days about 
Cullen or Finn McCool or whatever. These storytellers would go around in an era before radio or before television. Or before podcasts. Or before podcasts, thank you, Gerald. Passing on and retaining the local tradition and passing on stories. And that would be the night's entertainment. People would gather in a house and this storyteller, I think Shana Key means storyteller. That's right, yes. Would come in and talk. You know, around the fire, people would gather and listen in the in the, in the candlelight or whatever. So it's a very rich part of uh, old Ireland, which Barclay represented. So you you've gone into college, and you I know because I'm your son, uh, were extremely intelligent, and you came out with an engineering degree. All through college, did you keep the ventriloquism going? Oh, I did. Yeah, there were concerts all over Ireland every weekend. Perhaps I'd be on the boards doing my stuff. And then, uh, when I was 20, in 1956, an impresario from America sent a group of people over to do an X-Factor type of audition Mm. for Irish acts to go on an all-American TV show, the Ted Mac Original Amateur Hour. It had been on television for some 30 years, first of all radio. Pat Boone started his career on that show. Vince Lucas called... Paul Winchell started his career on that show. But they came to Ireland anyway looking to see what Irish young people did. And they uh, auditioned something like a thousand people and they chose 13 acts. And one of the acts was myself. I took a leprechaun with me to the audition. This element, I suppose, a leprechaun from Ireland. Surefire winner. Surefire winner, (laughs) yeah. So they asked me would I go along and I said sure. All of a sudden I was in the big time. And um, KLM flew over. KLM flew us over. Dutch. We were met by a pipe band and given allegedly the keys of New York. Yeah. I don't know whether that's true or not, but a key was waved around yeah. as if it was. It may have been only a stage prop. Went on the show, 13 acts. People voted in by ringing up. I had a, an aunt, Florence Cunningham, who had a pub in Leitrim, from Shambo. And Leitrim, at that time, 56, there were no jobs in Ireland. And the boat was really the only the only mm. solution for many people. And the people from Leitrim used to go to my, some of them, used to go to my aunt's pub, have what they called an Irish wake, whereby they'd invite all their friends and they'd have a big get-together and say goodbye now, we'll see you soon. They'd head off to America, many of them possibly never to return. They used to write to my Aunt Florrie and she used to write back to them. And uh, when she heard that her nephew was going to the Ted Mack show, <laughs> as far as I can see, she wrote to all these people from, from Shambo, etc., who had their wakes in her pub mm. and um, told them to watch out for George. Consequently, when the phones were ringing, I'd say I had quite a coterie of people from, from Shambo at the other end. And I got the most votes, so I was kept back for a second week. Votes came in again, and I came out on top, so I was kept back right. for the second week. And then third week, with all my friends gone, I was alone, the Irish man standing right. against 12 American acts. And yet again, I succeeded. <laughs> so okay. uh, this made me a three-time winner, which meant that I would be recalled for a major show in the Madison Square Garden in a year's time. That was the plan. Yeah. And I came back again to great uh, tatara and yeah. a couple of pictures in the paper and was interviewed on radio and so on and so forth. People said I had improved enormously and my material <laughs> was so fresh. It was absolutely <laughs> incredible. You're well, letting yeah. out the secrets now, aren't you? I am indeed. But you had like, you've never been somebody who's been, uh, you know, in all the years I've grown up <laughs> with you, boastful or let stuff get to your head. But I mean, at 20 years old to be... I mean, there was no television in Ireland then. No, there wasn't. There was uh, barely radio, I suppose. You're suddenly on the streets of New York, which must have been something of a oh, sight to behold. Oh, it was absolutely fantastic, yeah. Well, you weren't there. I was. Were you? I was. Oh, I, you were. I was there then. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yes, missed Barclay you. at home. I was surprised you didn't butt in. Oh, well, I, I, I'm very shy. You no, know, you're not really. shy. Oh, I'm awfully shy. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, uh, 1956, we were brought up to the White House. Outside of the White House, Ike was ill at the time, right. and Nixon uh, was his running mate. And there was a big sign as we left our hotel in New York saying, Stick with Ike and get stuck with Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Which was actually well, quite it was, it was, yeah. Well, I mean, Ike was re-elected, uh, although he was ill. 
and then subsequently, as you know, yeah, we got stuck with Nixon. Nixon. And we got stuck yeah, with Nixon. And Where there was a young, there was a young, um, a young Irish senator, John F. Kennedy. Waiting and in the wings. Quite funny enough, a lot of the Americans weren't very pleased with John F. Kennedy because right. he he was playing the racist card of it. Yeah, well, sure, it was very. They racist. said, in other words, he was wanted American to be for the Americans, yeah. whatever their color, yeah. whatever their creed. Gerald, well, yes. so we missed your. Uh, by, where are you from? Oh yes, well then, um, how did you how did you meet me? Oh yes, I know how you did. Well, actually, Gerald, you weren't there, was I not? No, you weren't. I had done my research. There you are, you see. You, I had Gerald Mark one. Oh dear me! Here you go again. The, the other dummy that I'd made myself, mm. because at that stage you, you you wanted to create a character. That was all important. The famous ventriloquist at that time was a fellow called Edgar Bergen, yeah. with a dummy called Charlie McCarthy mm. and Mortimer Snerd. And Mortimer Snerd was sort of a, a country bumpkin. But I had the schoolboy character. I think I'm wearing his, ja- his, his jacket. You are wearing his jacket, yes. And his trousers. Not his trousers. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I took these two in case I had to do a, a second performance. Mm. So... There was a lot of fuss over the, 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 the first show, which was an all-Irish show, because the first act was on was a, was a trio from Trinity College. They sang a song in Irish, but it was a translation of Rock Around the Clock. Right. Nine o'clock, with all the club, with yeah. three o'clock, rock. Three o'clock, car o'clock, go o'clock, rock. All the Irish were totally scandalised by the fact that people in Ireland were singing Rock, rock Around the, the Clock. Yeah. And they weren't singing Makushla or whatever, you know. But the next week I, I sang, uh, I think it was a song from the green fields of Ireland. And the third time I sang... Uh, uh, Houses are sailing. Uh, or something. <laughs> not Phil the Fooders Ball, but uh, anyway, one Some of those Irish something. songs. So I made Wackery, sure that yeah. apart from the humour and the jokes, and the you got a tear there was, in the Irish, <laughs> there was an Irish element too, which probably helped as well, you know. So that's right. You came along later because I... I um, I couldn't afford a guy like you. No, no, because you've got moving eyes. That's right. And you've got moving eyebrows. And you've got moving ears. And, and, and they can show me teeth like that, you see? Yeah. You can see that I brush me teeth. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> and you can wag your ears. And you can wink. And so on. So there was a guy who was over from England. Uh, he was a ventriloquist. And he advertised that he had a, a doll for sale. You know, I went along with a friend and uh, we purchased you. How much really? was he? Well, in actual fact, if you bought him from the store, he was 25 to 30 Irish pounds at the time. Wow, that's a and lot. I, I got him for seven pounds, which was my week's wages. At the time. A week's wages, right. Yeah. So that would and be... I'd say today uh, they cost about 2,000. Really? Me? That's right. <laughs> oh, I got it me own. <laughs> okay, here I am. So had you made quite a bit of money then by the time you were like 20 or was there was no, it just for the love of the game, no, no, like no, podcasting? No, 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 no. To give you an idea, when RTE, when our Irish television started in 1961, I was on the first show which went out on New Year's Eve. Uh, I, I was then asked to do a show the following Saturday on a children's show. So I had two shows that first week. And then I re- more or less was asked to repeat, go back the following week on the kids' show. And then I eventually had my own show, 13 weeks at a time. And this went on and on. But, say, my fee at the time might have been €7, Euro, which was my week's wages at the time. Right. But the whole budget for the show was €20. <laughs> it was €20. Euro. It was €20. Euro. Right. So the producer had to do all the sets and all the thing and get the, get the time and the whole lot together for the other 13 quid, right. like, you know. So you were a big shot. Oh, it was a big shot, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, he was saying it's all over <laughs> Ireland, weren't you? I was, yeah. Yeah. Did anybody ask for your autograph? No, and then. Really? Yes. I remember I was out in, in uh, a hospital out in Baldoil. It was called the Little Willie Hospital. Right. We will move fast on. Yes, we'll okay. dwell on that. But uh, while, I was, uh, while, in there. while I was out there, uh, when I was finished, uh, these nurses ran off. And they presented their arms to me. And I said, what's all that about? Would you ever sign me arm, please? Ah, lovely. Uh, I did, but I hoped that they'd wash themselves before they I think I saw you. I was in a hospital patient. recently. I saw an old lady with a 
Sure, she'll oh, be like How about that now? Oh, Jeepers. <laughs> Said she never watched it. She never watched it off. Oh, it's not lovely. That's lovely. We, we talked about that you were on opening night in Irish television, but for years before that, you were on radio. That's right. Which yeah. uh, my American friends find hilarious that there was things like Irish dancing on the radio and, and uh, ventriloquism, <laughs> which are two parts of the arts that are so reliant on seeing <laughs> the visual well, representation you know, uh, of it. I, I, I find that fa- a fascinating comment mm. because there's also horse racing on radio. Yeah. In fact, you have football on, on radio. Yeah. And you have... So well, you I, mean, have, I, there, I, I know what you mean. There's a difference in that because yeah. in horse racing, it's exactly the same image and you just need to know which horse is, is in charge. And, you know, if there was someone in the background going, he moved his lips a little bit there when uh, Gerald said something, you know, okay, but like there's uh, Irish dancing, all you can hear is the clatter of feet. The actual abilities of the ventriloquist and the Irish dancers comes into question. A football commentary, the guy can say, your man's having a terrible game and he's hoofed that into the stands, <laughs> right? Yes. But, but I mean, to me, it's, it, it's a, a lovely thing in this time when we're snowed by technology that people were able to use their imaginations through a medium of radio, which at the time was the greatest thing. Because well, of, Edgar know. Bergen, uh, who I mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, made his fortune, and he really made a fortune on radio. And uh, he started around 1933, I think. He was the top performer and the highest paid performer for about yeah. 10, 15 years. If you can create the character, and if people sort of see photographs maybe of, of the character and they hear the voice and the the, 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 there appears to be two people talking, then they sort of say, "My goodness me!" And that's that, that's uh, they, they identify with another person being at the uh, at the thing, and the lip movement. Yeah, so what, you know? So you were t- about twenty five. You opened Irish television. You were on Irish radio. You're still only in your mid twenties. I know you got a um, an engineering degree and you took a job at um, selling pumps and boilers to a burgeoning Irish semi-state facility. Um, we had to set up electricity supply boards and we had to set up railways and we had to set up all this kind of stuff. You had a nine to five That's uh, correct. that was very straight. Yeah. Uh, what was the family stroke, brothers, sisters, friends view of you? Like, were you uh, odd or were you, you know, was it, was it, was it seen as kind of, he's a bit mad, like, but he's doing this straight thing and at night you used to go into our team on Friday and do your show, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. You see, I, I think ventriloquism, from a business point of view, is very useful because, yeah. believe you it or get not... get your you, clients to say something that they didn't well, need to. Well, no. Sorry, you, yeah, yeah, that, that's one way of looking at it. But the point is, as a ventriloquist, you have to think for two people. You have to get the reaction that the guy is going to have to your comments. And I think it makes you more empathetic to people's feelings. You know, you, you, you identify with the other guy's point of view. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm if i selling something, and in fact, you used to do that. That's right. If I was making a presentation, I'd sometimes put your man sitting on the on the couch and make a presentation to him, and then he'd tear strips off it at the end of it, say, I didn't like this bit, didn't like that bit, didn't like the other <laughs> bit, like, you know. And this way, you've got a feeling for, for people. And I, I think it has been very helpful because, as somebody said, what is truth? Like, you know, truth yeah. depends on where you're standing. Truth is, is it's it's a dark night, uh, or truth is there is no light. Mm. Wh- which is it? Both are true. You know, there is no light. It is dark. But which is true? Mm. You know? Can't both things in that case both be true? Both things can be true, yeah. yeah. And you have to accept that. Mm. But if you go in saying, no, this is only one truth, it's yeah. dark, then you're standing on somebody's belief, which is equally good to yours. Sure. Ventriloquism, just while we're on the subject of ventriloquism, it's kind of been a dying art that's, there's always a couple of ventriloquists in the world. You were probably the, you and a guy called Eugene Lambert were probably the two preeminent uh, ventriloquists in Ireland for 30 years together. That's right. He made a career of it with his whole family, puppet shows and all that kind of stuff. You stuck to the double jobbing kind of thing that mm-hmm. you did through the 60s. So you had your own show uh, in the 60s every Friday and every Monday to Thursday and, and Friday you go into an office That's just right. down the road. I presume you're making more money in the ventriloquism or were you making more money in the you see, like, I don't move. This is what they all say. I don't move just for money. Okay. Right. For me, this is my hobby. Yeah. I enjoy it. I enjoy going out and being able to make people forget their worries, enjoy a show, have a laugh, 
maybe appreciate some of the art of ventriloquism mm -hmm. and take a bow at the end. To me, that was satisfying. It also was very satisfying to be on a TV show. I mean, let's just do the math. Mm -hmm. Let, let's supposing you, you have 24,000 people listening to this podcast at the moment. That's a thousand man days of 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's 3,000 working days of eight hours, seven days a week. 3,000 working days every week are being spent listening to your show. In my case, I think you could add multiplied by zero. 10. Yeah, zero. Because there, no, there was only one channel in Ireland. There so was only one channel. Everyone watched it. Agreed, yeah. There were more people watching my show in Cork than watching the news. That means there were two people watching the show in Cork. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> Nothing of the sort. But, but there were about, I think there were about 250,000 people watching it. That to me was a challenge. I mean, uh, I felt it incumbent upon me to try and make sure that those 250 man years were being <clears throat> used beneficially. Mm. We had a show where we had young people who performed and danced and, and uh, made recitations. I was the link person. Whitney, I haven't forgotten you. Okay, don't. <laughs> you might be out of the job if you do. Okay. And... Uh, with Barclay and with my other uh, other other uh, other puppets, we presented this show, mm. and it was it was liked, and they they people wrote in, and they put it competitions and so on and so forth. But to me, it was it was a labor of love. I enjoyed it. In the same with the with the engineering point of view, I was a representative. I was trying to persuade people to buy things. The products that we were selling were hopefully as good and a lot better than other products that were around. Yeah. And my motto at the time was, you know, un until we make the sale, we represent our supplier. But after we make the sale, we, make, we represent the client. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that he gets what it says on the tin. And these were my driving Goals philosophies and, yeah. uh, from the very beginning. And it, it, it dates back to my father. My father was always a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Mm. He would not take the accepted sick leave in the civil service and got into terrible trouble with his colleagues. You know, they say, oh, you're entitled to take five days on, on unaccounted sick leave. And he said, I'm not sick like, you know. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as far as I know, this led to a bit of aggro <laughs> on yeah. the job and yeah. still does with yeah. some people who sort of say, look, why is it that this people say, oh, I'm entitled to seven days on, unaccounted for sick leave, so which means I can take them. Whereas in actual fact, it starts out as being to cover the people who actually are sick, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. But anyway... It's abuse. Yeah. When I was growing up, you were very famous. For, I mean, one of the funny stories which I tell about both of you is yeah. that uh, Dad used to do some specials from Dublin Zoo where you would you would throw your voice and make the animals uh, talk. That's right, yes. Maybe I was three or four years of age, but I had been to the zoo and there was a huge bison in the zoo that when I went up to the cage, he was at the front and he talked to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like going, Dad, Dad, the bison's talking to me. And you were saying, I clearly is. And the bison was telling me where it was from and how, knew my name. And I went home from the zoo unlike any other kid because my, my the animals when I went to the zoo talked. And then about three months would go by and uh, four months we'd go to the zoo again. And I'd go tearing off to my friend in the bison enclosure. Um, my father would, of course, forgotten probably by then that he'd, he'd made the bison talk to me. And I'd be a little five-year-old, four-year-old kid at the bison enclosure shouting in front of a whole bunch of other school kids up to the bison saying, come on down, it's me, it's Sean. And all the teachers telling the other kids to step away from the <laughs> mad child in the corner. And then eventually dad would come along pushing the, my sister, George, and go, oh, oh, I've just made a boo-boo here. So then he'd have to put on a show with the bison talking in front of all the children. And there the teachers would be going, there's George causing major later in life problems for his son there. <laughs> Gerald, did it go to your head? Oh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. I got a very big head, you see. <laughs> With plenty of space, isn't that right, George? What That's was right, your right. best memory of the of the of of that 60s, the show well, that I, you I watched? Well, I remember something, Sean, I don't know if you remember it, but I used to come and see you every Saturday. When I was finished, uh, George here would take me and he'd say, Gerald, is it going away now? And he'd send you into the kitchen and I'd disappear. Yeah. And then you said, I want to say goodbye to George. To Gerald. And you'd say to Gerald. You'd say to me, yes. 
And uh, I'd say, uh, well, yes, okay, so uh, uh, take me outside the door, George. So, George, you take me outside the door. That's right. And he closed the door, and uh, Therese would take you inside. Therese my mother. That's right. And I disappeared again. And then Sean would say, I want to wave good day to him when he's in his car. And uh, George would take me out and put me sitting in the car, isn't that right? That's right, sir. And he'd drive up the road, Sean would wave to me, and all the neighbours would be looking at George going up the road in his car saying, my God, what's that for that? Yeah, it looked a bit crazy. And then he'd, he'd stop halfway up the road and, and take you out. And then he'd turn back and come back and he'd take me up and he'd put me into a suitcase. And I remember I was in my suitcase with me eggs, me legs around me arms, me, me head. And all of a sudden you came in. That's right. And he said, hello, Jared. And I didn't say anything. You didn't. And you rushed downstairs and you said, George, Therese, Gerald is upstairs with his legs around his head and he, he wouldn't talk to me. I said he was dead in a case upstairs. I know, it's terrible. <laughs> Again, more trauma was that, for me. Was that the end up. of it? Well, it's, I can't remember. <laughs> but I think that was the end of it. <laughs> the question I wanted to know yes. uh, was, you, you mentioned earlier about it being your hobby. That's right. Did you always have that separation between church and state about your oh, job? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, in no way would I like to have been a full-time Vent. talking to you, Gerald. I'm sorry. I know, George. Well, you're a full-time dummy, Jerry. Oh, I am, of yeah, course. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. true. I'm full-time, full-time. Yeah, yeah. I can talk to dummies, Sean, very well. That's why I'm <laughs> talking to you. Oh, stop. And there is still an awful lot of ventriloquist around at the moment. I mean, you, you, you're you tending to be a bit dismissive. Uh, in America, you probably may or may not have heard, I think you saw him, Terry Fator. Yes. Who yeah, won X Factor. Yeah, yeah. Earning $10 million a year. In Vegas. In Vegas. There's Jeff Dunham, tours the world. Earning, I'd say, twenty million a year yeah. with his various uh, dummies. There's Jay Johnson, who's uh, got a one-man show. He was in one of the sitcoms in America while he was growing up, and now he's grown up and he's, he's, he's full time. In, 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 in and the Chuck Wood guy, David, David Strassman. Strassman yeah. uh, and then I put a link to that little girl that you saw who blew your socks off. And uh, she was absolutely terrific. Oh yeah, and she learned it all in two years, and it took you about ten. God, <laughs> say this and this is oh yeah. There's this astonishing young, I think, I think it was an X Factor or something oh, as well, yeah, she was on. America's Talent. America's, America's Got Talent. talent and yeah. uh, she's, uh, I, I sent the link to, to Dad and Gerald and they both looked at, at her and went, astonishing, didn't you? Oh, yes, I thought she was amazing. Absolutely. I want to know her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> she's and only she, 12. She has now, a, she'll grow up, she'll grow up. What age are and you, you'll Gerald? Grow old. What age are you? Ah, uh, I, I, I think I'm around 12 to 14. 12 to 14. Do you know Bart Simpson? No, I don't know he's Bart a, Simpson. He's about your age. Well, he's, he's a cartoon character. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't mind those cartoon characters. It's not real, you know. No, each other. So There's only a voice behind them. Crazy. So the other question I have for um, primarily George is the, 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 the sort of Ireland that you've seen growing up from the 40s, 50s, 60s. What are the sort of observations that you give, you know, looking back on where we've come and, and, and what you feel is, is great and what do you think might not be so great? Gonga, George, gonga. What do you mean, goma? Grunt the old man alert. Grunt the old man alert. That's right. He always says that, you know, when he's allowed to give a rant. OK, rant away. OK. Well, my me- recollection at school, going to tenements, the Vincent de Paul Society, maybe 12 people in two rooms toilets out the back absolute terrible and uh, funny enough my memory of them was that they were sort of happy Mm -hmm. but um, you know happy in squalor which uh, we don't like now you don't have that we don't have that which I think is absolutely fantastic we are regarded now as a a grown-up nation but I think we are losing various aspects of our, our ethos as we grow the caring element is now being replaced with the commercial. For example, when I grew up, uh, when, I w- when I went for a job, uh, when I qualified, I was offered a job in Shell in uh, Frawley in England. I think the salary was around £750 a, a year. This would be 1958. And uh, I was also offered a job in 
University College Dublin at £300 a year. And I took the job in Dublin because I felt that I wanted to be here and to contribute and to give something back, as they say today. You must be very proud of me, who's just buggered off for 21 years. I'm joking. <laughs> you are giving it to the world. You're giving it to the world. You know, shape yeah, and size, advertising, you know? great. But, uh, but uh, you see, that's the difference between myself and you. That's the 20-year gap, mm. shall we say, uh, or 27-year gap. But I think in the last 27 years, while you've been away, mm. it has become even more commercially orientated. Whereas everybody is concerned, it's somebody else's problem to solve. Mm. And we talked about many of these problems before sure. we started this podcast. And there's a Jesuit who is a philosopher of sorts or a spiritual character. He makes a number of things that if you want to change the world, you first of all have to change yourself. We can all give out about the other guy and what he isn't doing. And as somebody said, if you're pointing a finger at somebody, remember there are three fingers pointing back at you. Yeah. And you have to ask, are you making your contribution? And I feel that we have made enormous strides. When I was starting out, there was about 400,000 people employed in Ireland. That was around 1958. And now there are two million people employed, a fantastic increase. That level of employment brings its own responsibilities to the individual as well as to the state. Mm. And the state can only function if the individual performs. Mm. And I'm sad a little bit that I feel that the individual is losing his sense of personal responsibility. That makes sense? That does make sense, yeah. I mean, I think I... I, think I, I um, it's a big, long speech anyway. No, You're all going to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would agree with that to a certain extent. I mean, I think we you need know, to be started the podcast talking about civil servants and, and the fact that we had to build a country you know very quickly and a, a huge part of your life was in the service of both cultural contribution to that through Gerald and yourself and Barclay and, and through you. the um, the rolling up the sleeves and getting corporations tooled up and there's something very creative about what you did with your life and I feel there's a lot of creativity gone missing a little bit in the country that we don't tend to apply and we are quite a creative known to be quite a creative people in terms of our writers and our musicians and our and our ventriloquists oh and, very good yes and, don't uh, forget us and and so I, sh I just feel that there's you know there's a there's a there seems to be problems that seem to be if people would just as you would say take responsibility solvable and we just don't seem to solve them and, but i i said here, we talked about it before about the stem subjects yeah uh, I chose engineering as a degree uh, path because I was good at science, technology, uh, engineering. engineering and math. Yeah. These were practical subjects. I mean, I remember consciously not doing history because I wanted to do chemistry. Yeah. But I think I might have been wrong because I think the arts give you a reason for living, whereas the STEM subjects only give you the tools to live. And as somebody said uh, recently, it should be STEAM subjects. Yeah. Science, technology, arts and maths. Mm. So that the soul goes back into the activities we do. Yeah. And that's, I think, is your point. The creativity or the soul has to be embedded again mm. into these subjects. And we, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be directed only towards the implementation for monetary gain in the various activities. Perhaps it is being focused and channeled towards towards something which will collapse in the end yeah. because, you know, we're talking about robotics and all these sort of things that, you know... Sure, there'll be artificial intelligence like you. Yeah, indeed. Wait till, <laughs> I, wait till I'm in charge, I'm telling you. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, there we are. So I do I, feel, I do see uh, different issues. I mean, I think you could, even despite all the crap that's going through right now, America is <laughs> probably still the... I um, heard that. That's not a bad yeah, language. That's good. That is definitely not a bad language. You, all right, you can read all that right, in the newspaper okay. today. <laughs> I was told before I came on by my father that he didn't want to use any bad language. So those of you who are regular listeners... Well, I'm present and I'm just a young fella. Isn't yeah, that well, right, that George? was the reason right. Dad said that there's <laughs> children present. Um, but, uh, you know, America is still, for all its flaws right now, probably the place where most 
those patents are, are, are recorded every yeah. year and it's still a creative country. I, I worry about the effect that Trump has. Australia, I feel, in government is far more creative than we are. We have a, an unfortunate history that got uncovered in the 80s of backhanders and dodgy politicians and corruption, which is not unique to Ireland by any means, which we've, we've tried to get rid of. But we still have the talky fest and the lack of action and the lack of anything and a, a revolving door of ministerial appointments where nothing really gets done. And that's very frustrating. And there's one thing else, John, to <laughs> yeah. tell you about 1956. What the happened? most important thing that happened to him in 1956. Go on, Georgia. All right. Well, I was on a concert in the Gresham Hotel and there was a group of harpists on. They were very good. I was compared on the show. And uh, while I was there, this young lady in her school uniform comes up to me and says um, she'd lost the key to her harp. And I said, oh, well, I must help you look for the key to your harp. So we both went round to the stage, uh, backstage and round, and eventually went to the porter, and eventually we found the key to her harp. And uh, that young lady, 11 years later, Turned out to be my wife. Yes. So now. The aforementioned trays. The aforementioned trays. Who thought and we would use the word aforementioned? There you go. I must say that she has been very patient. Oh, she has to be with you, that's for sure. <laughs> that. Uh, she's been very patient and loving and raised a fantastic family. There you go. You can't, you can't disagree with that, Sean. My last and funny stories of, of both of you was when I was working in Ireland in the advertising business, probably around 1990. And hello, Brendan O'Reilly, because I think you listened to the podcast. There was an ad we were trying to do for 7up, which oh, at the gosh, time used yeah, Fido yes. Dido, possibly your last public appearance um, oh, well, yeah, on a billboard on, anyway, I'd say. Yes. The lads yeah. in the office had an idea, which was the, the, the Fido Dido character from 7up with a dummy on his knee saying it's ghoul to be clear. Uh, I told them, well, my father has Gerald and Gerald That's would right. be great. And they came out yes. to see Gerald. Yes. And when they came out, my father had Gerald on his knee and they yes. were talking to the two boys and Gerald was engaging to them just like he is right now. Yes, yes, yes. Gerald was saying stuff like, well, will you need me or do you need the other fella as well? And they were saying, no, Gerald, we just need you. And they were having a conversation with both of them, with both, with both Gerald and my father. And then arranged that Gerald was perfect for the part, Great. signed you up on the spot. That's right. And said that you'd be needed next Wednesday and yeah. then said goodbye to my dad, yeah. bye to Gerald. Yeah. And then halfway into town realised they were talking to the dummy. And so was I. I was talking to two of them. You were. <laughs> The other dummy oh, was Tom Kelly. Uh, speaking of talking to yourself, you launched a book. I did indeed. I uh, about book, 15 yeah. years ago, I suppose. No, no. But, well, 2003. Yeah, you're right. Ooh, there well you go. Done. Time yeah. flies. Yes, time flies. Done my research. Uh, it's, it's mainly about my activities in the ventriloquial field and leading up to it and about the strange things that happened along the way. One of the last questions is, and I'm fascinated to hear your answer to this, is what, what do you say to, first of all, uh, a, a young boy or girl who's interested in ventriloquism Yes. today, both of you. Gerald, this yes, might be for yes, you yes. as well. Uh, what advice would you give them? And also, secondly, you know, what advice do you, would you give back to just um, your, your younger self or some, somebody just who's a teenager or just finishing school today? Well, on the ventriloquism, I'd say there are so many heroes to look into or to follow or to examine. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, as in my day, getting to see or hear these people. I used to be crouched over the radio listening to AFN in the old days, trying to get Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Now I have a briefcase full of all their recordings, wow, <laughs> hundreds yeah. of them, uh, that I bought years ago. But to segue just briefly before you finish yeah. that question, because we'll probably end on your answer to that question, uh, there's a nice sort of completion to the story because I remember when I got into advertising, you found out that there was no record of you on television because they recorded over all your tapes of your shows and I remember going to RT and thought I'd surprise you with finding something and we found one thing that you looked at and went oh that wasn't very good it was, a, <laughs> it was a, a show after the event about some of the very famous people and it is worth mentioning a lot of the very famous artists uh, even still working today in Ireland uh, made their first appearance with George and uh, Gerald here on the, on the show and then tell us what happened uh, you, you, you finally have an, a, a beautiful record of your career that you can watch. Tell us what happened, that story. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. the Ted Nax show, yes. Well, I mean, the, the American show, I remember when I was doing it, 
which was sponsored by Geritol yeah. for tired blood. Yeah. I saw a guy with a camera. Cine 8 or something. Yeah. Cin- Cinema 8 yeah. or something like that. One of these, the, he was taking a, a recording of the show. So that was in 1956. I was back there again, as I told you, in 1958. And then about 10 or 15 years later, I started trying to uh, see if I could find, is there any record of the show, you see? Mm. So couldn't find anything. There had been a, a, two, a two-year gap between my return and when I was on because Geritol also sponsored a quiz show called 21. And there was a big scandal about that show because they found that the contestants were getting the answers before they oh, this went is on. the Charles Van Doren or whatever, yeah. There's uh, a movie made of it. There is a movie made of it. Yeah. I think it's called Quiz Show, the movie. Yes, the Quiz Show movie, yeah. Great finds. So it was a terrible scandal, mm. and Geritol pulled immediately their sponsorship from the Quiz Show. Yeah. But they also happened to be sponsors for a Ted Mack show. So that got pulled. So I, I kept getting letters saying, uh, we won't be needing you in September at the moment because some yeah. things have to be ironed out, like... Now, at this time, it was great because I was dying with pneumonia and yeah. Asian flu at this time. And I nearly turned my toes up, as they say. Anyway, at the end of the year, I had recovered and uh, was able to go back in 58 to participate in the show. To cut a long story short, I hit on, a, on an internet connection. I got in touch with this guy down in San Francisco and I said, look, you know, what's this about the Ted Mack show? He says, oh, yeah, I, I have inherited all the tapes. And I said, well, would you by any chance have the 1956? So he looked it up and he had uh, two I did first time in 56 and the one I did in 58. But they, he said, the story is, he says, they were left to me. And in the old days, the Americans had a bunker in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. That is also very fun. And Norland Hardy fan. Exactly. <clears throat> and they had these this big bunker where the great and the good would be whisked off to in the event of a nuclear attack. Now, this is 1956-58 when the Cold yeah. War was at its highest. And they had, I don't know, billions of dollars there and food and that to keep them going for a couple of years so that when the radiation had fallen down, they could come out to start again. And eventually the need for the bunker's size grew, so they had to move out of that bunker to another one. Where yeah. that one is, I don't know. But the one in the Blue Ridge Mountains was donated to the state for the National Archives. He donated all the tapes to the National Archives, so deep in the bowels of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia were the tapes of my show. And I said, well, can I get a copy? And he said, yeah, well, they're a bit expensive, which they were. But uh, anyway, we struck a deal. And he said it's expensive because they take out the, the movies, they clean every frame, right? and they then put it onto a DVD. Yeah. And he says it looks like it was recorded yesterday, it except does great it's in black and white. Yeah. And in due course, three DVDs come along, and I could sit back and enjoy I this know. young fella. Ah, oh, this angelical fella. Well, it's kind of weird looking at your dad at 20, <laughs> you know. It's kind of, oh. He's only 20 now, isn't that right? Oh, yes, the other thing is uh, George is born on the 29th of February. So he's born in 1936, that's right. So, so he, he only had 20 birthdays. So he's only had 20 birthdays. And so he's he looking a, forward to his 25th. He was a cheap date as a dad. <laughs> Anyway, finish the point before we get up, we get kicked out of the room. But aspiring ventriloquist needs to study all of the various material that's available to him or her. And enjoy it and go out and, and try it. By trying, you improve. You can learn from all these people, from the books that are available. There are DVDs available now. They're absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And they will teach you the rudiments, no problem. But then use it for the benefit of others. <laughs> Does it bite you? What? Or, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be the sort of thing like what happened with you with the, yeah. the Sheriff Creek uh, story that you get into it to such a... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I are you surprised it. that you're still doing it? Oh, little this, little this. There's only a little this, only a little this. I, 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 I want to tell them something yeah. as well. Among life's dying embers, these are my regrets. When I'm right, no one remembers... When I'm wrong, no one forgets. How's that? Very good. I think that's an interesting, an interesting roundup. 
that's probably the advice you'd probably give to a, a, a person anyway who's, who's nothing to do with ventriloquism or what would you say to your young nieces or a young person today who's entering the I'd world I'd say remember that, that to change the world you have to change yourself to take responsibility for your actions to listen and to hear when you're listening to see and to see the magic around you and to do your best at whatever you take on that's it more or less that's excellent George and Gerald it was a pleasure having you oh, both it was nice seeing you too Sean on the show um, I normally play out to the famous uh, Stop the Pigeon music but yeah. I was wondering if you two would like to sing well, us out I, on the show I will and maybe you'll join me because mm. I the north and I've been south and I the east and west oh I've been just a rolling stone Still, there's one place on this earth we always love the best. Just one little spot we call our own. Oh, Dublin can be heaven with coffee at eleven and a stroll, a little stroll in Stephen's Green, in Stephen's Green. Grafton Street's a wonderland, there's magic in the air. There are diamonds in the lady's eyes and gold dust in her hair. So if you don't believe us, why then come and meet us there? Where? In Dublin on a sunny summer morning. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. That was Gerald Thank and Shorsha on Thank Pint you. with Shawnee B. I'll catch you all next time. Thanks a lot. Bye, Gerald. Bye now. Be seeing you again sometime.